Hello again, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to a talk on inflammatory bowel disease. Now, I did a video on inflammatory bowel disease about seven years ago, and uh, I've been going through a lot of my videos and realized that some of them are maybe out of date, but others are um, not ordered in the best logical order. Um, for you to understand what I'm talking about. And this happened to fall into the latter category. So I decided to kind of redo this video, put, put it in a little bit more of an intuitive order, and also give you sort of a um, pathologic underpinning of this disease. Because, uh, you know, that's really useful for sort of understanding the treatment and management, really, um, and sort of some of the, the manifestations and implications. Um, so even if you're not not taking step one, I would recommend to pay a little bit of attention to that. I'm primarily going to focus on step two and three stuff. Uh, but if you are an M2 taking step one, this is very useful for you because you will see this in the clinic. Um, you will get test questions on this on regardless of what step. Uh, so so I, I do think that regardless of where you're at in your training, you can uh, certainly benefit from this talk. And you will get test questions on IBD on any step. You'll get at least one, probably two or three. Uh, so this is very, 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 very useful for, for test uh, purposes. If you haven't had the opportunity yet, please consider subscribing to my Patreon. I have the link below in the description of the video, or you can click on the I button on the upper right-hand corner. Uh, if you consider chipping in a dollar a month if you like these videos, I really appreciate the support. Uh, it helps offset the time uh, that it takes to put these videos together. Uh, so thank you very much in advance for your consideration. Now this is the stuff we're going to go over. It looks a lot, look, looks like a lot, but I'm going to try to cram it uh, to about 25 to 30 minutes. Uh, and uh, really, it it's not a topic that you can really gloss over and talk about in five minutes. It's just one of those things that there's so much material that you need to know about this disease because it just gets examiners love to hit this from all angles. And so, uh, you know, you watch this once, you get 30 minutes of it, uh, you really will be prepared for any question they might throw at you on IBD. Let's start with a vignette. So how does this show up to you? We got a 35 year old man who shows up to the ED complaining of bloody diarrhea. He says that he's been having diarrhea for the last two weeks, but he was prompted to come in because this afternoon he noticed a maroon color in his stool. He says that he has abdominal pain but is unable to point to an exact spot. He rates it as 6 out of 10, and he's been trying to control it with Pepto-Bismol but to no avail. He's lost 10 pounds since his previous visit to the ER six months ago. His vitals are stable, but he's slightly febrile. So, uh, we have a patient here with chronic diarrhea, and that always warrants a workup. So we know we're going to have to do that. But there are some concerning features about this patient's presentation. First of all, he has a maroon color to his stool. Now, he's only 35, so we're not necessarily thinking about cancer. But there's this is not a normal diarrhea. This is not a diarrhea that you get from eating a bad hamburger. Uh, this is something, some kind of inflammatory process going on. It could be infectious, but more than likely because it's been going on for weeks, it's probably inflammatory. And so IBD is really something that, uh, that you would want to consider just by that alone. Now, in addition, he's got abdominal pain. Often you're going to have cramping and bloating and just feeling gross with diarrhea, regardless uh, if it's infectious or inflammatory. Um, or infectious and inflammatory for that matter. But here's where things really get problematic. He's lost weight. And you want to ask him, is that intentional or not? But he's lost 10 pounds. Um, and furthermore, uh, he's febrile. And we don't really know why. So this all looks like the picture of IBD. Now, is it Crohn's? Is it ulcerative colitis? We don't know. But that's why we're going to work the patient up. So what would you want to do? Well, first of all, you're going to get labs. You're going to, uh, you've got a patient with a fever, with pain, with inflammation. You're going to want to get a CBC. You're also going to get liver function tests. Now, CBC, CMP, all that stuff is really just typical workup stuff. What else are you going to get? Well, you're probably going to get a, a, a nutritional workup. So iron and folate and B12. And that's going to be really important anyway if you suspect IBD, and we'll go into why that is. 
Now, if you've ever referred a patient with chronic diarrhea to, to a gastroenterologist, the first thing they're going to get is stool studies. So they really appreciate it in advance if, uh, if, if you do that uh, before you call them. So stool studies are going to be really important here. And stool studies will really give you, uh, really help you narrow down what the possible causes of the diarrhea is. So we're really hitting everything. Fecal fat will look for malabsorption. Blood will look for inflammation. Ova and parasites will look for parasitic causes. Culture will look for possible bacterial causes. Fecal calprotectin is something that can help you elucidate a possible IBD. And a C. diff toxin you don't need to get, but if they have a history of recent antibiotic use, it could be useful. Serology will be useful uh, for possibly figuring out what the cause of the IBD is. So you'll get ASCA and PIANCA, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. And then imaging is always useful. Usually you'll get a CT, but you can try barium enema, MRI, or even plain films. Colonoscopy will ultimately be where we're headed because you're going to need a biopsy to make a definitive diagnosis. So just an overview, IBD is, believe it or not, inflammatory. It's idiopathic. We don't really know why it happens, but we do know that it's associated with other autoimmune diseases, either in the patient or in the family history. And of course, it involves the GI tract, but it does have extra intestinal manifestations as well. Usually it shows up in early adulthood. It's more common in whites and Ashkenazi Jews. There is an increasing incidence. We don't really know why, but there's a higher incidence in developed countries. So that sort of lends itself to that cleanliness hypothesis that we see with asthma. Uh, so that may be a possibility. There is an increased risk for colon cancer. So that's going to play a role in sort of our long-term surveillance of these patients and a reduced quality of life from symptoms. There are two types, Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. We'll talk about the similarities and differences between those two. So we'll start out with Crohn's disease. This is a transmural gastrointestinal mucosal infection, and it's anywhere from the mouth to the anus. So those two things really separate this apart from ulcerative colitis. The most common site of involvement is the terminal ileum, so the very last part of the small intestine. Now, there are a couple really important things that happen in the terminal ileum. First of all, it's the site of B12 absorption, and it's also the site of absorption for bile salts. Well, I should say absorption there. So if you have inflammation down there, then you're going to have difficulty absorbing those things, and that can lend itself to manifestations. Symptomatically, this will present uh, just like uh, ulcerative colitis with chronic crampy abdominal pain, but Crohn's is going to tend to be right lower quadrant if they can point to a place. And the reason is because the terminal ileum is in the right lower quadrant, and that's the most common site of involvement. There may be systemic, nonspecific signs like weight loss, anorexia, and low-grade fever, but that doesn't really tell you much. There are also several extra intestinal manifestations, which we'll go into in a little bit. Now on pathology, this is something you've got to know for step one, but it's good to know for step two and three because they may, they may tell you this in words, they won't give you a picture, but they'll tell you this in words. And what you see here is the pathognomonic sign for Crohn's disease. And that is, I'll put it in yellow here, this is a non-caseating granuloma. And this is pathognomonic for Crohn's. So if you see non-caseating granuloma, it is Crohn's, 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 Crohn's. So know that association. This is a growth specimen, and what you see here is something called a skip, uh, or, well, actually this is cobblestoning. I'm not going to get ahead of myself. So what cobblestoning is, is it's areas of inflammation that pull down healthy parts of the small, or of the large bowel. Uh, and so it is uh, It is associated with the skip lesion part, which we'll get to in a little bit. Uh, but there's healthy bowel surrounding the inflammation, and the inflammation pulls down the healthy part, and it causes this sort of cobblestone appearance. And this is characteristic of Crohn's. Now, this skip lesion... Uh, manifestation that you see lends itself to something called the string sign. Now, the string sign is when you get a, a contrasted uh, CT, 
So you have the patient swallow barium or you do a barium enema, but usually uh, when you're looking at the uh, at the intestine, you're going, going to do, well, you can do one or the other. But in any case, what you'll see is you'll see areas of filling normally. So this is normal and this is normal and this is normal and normal. But then you'll see these these thinned out areas. And what this corresponds to is stricture. So you'll see areas of intermittent stricture and they look kind of like strings. So you have this sort of like beads on a string appearance and that's characteristic of Crohn's. And so this is called the string sign and it has to do with strictures. This is what you see on colonoscopy and this is the cobblestoning. So you have cobblestoning here and um, this is what you see with Crohn's. Now, if you work your colonoscope through the intestine, what you'll often see is areas that look like this, and then maybe you'll see some intermittent, less diseased areas, and then you see more diseased areas, and kind of skips around, and that's the skip lesions. Okay, so skip lesions, and that's different from ulcerative colitis, as we'll get into. Now, as you work your colonoscope up, you always want to get a visualization of the terminal ileum because if you see involvement of the terminal ileum, then you absolutely know for certain you're working with Crohn's because ulcerative colitis will never, ever affect the terminal ileum. All right, let's move on to UC. So UC is a continuous ulcerative colonic inflammation that only affects the mucosa and submucosa. So let's just go into what these layers are real quick. So at the very, uh, in the very inside, um, opposite from the lumen, you have your mucosa. And the mucosa is divided up into the epithelium, lamina propria, and muscularis mucosa. Uh, you can't really see that. And then beneath the muscularis mucosa, you have the submucosa. And beneath that, you have muscularis mucosa. And then beneath that, on the outside, you have adventitia or serosa. Same thing. So those are your layers. Now, ulcerative colitis will affect the mucosa and the submucosa. Whereas with Crohn's, you will affect all three layers. Now, ulcerative colitis is limited to the GI tract, but really, I should say, to the colon. Okay, it's only in the colon. Now, it affects the rectum most commonly, and the reason is because it starts in the rectum, and it works its way up. So you'll start in the rectum, and you'll gradually work your way up through the sigmoid and the descending colon and the transverse colon, and eventually uh, you'll get to the beginning of the ascending colon, but you will not go any further. You will not involve the terminal ileum or any other part of the GI tract. So this is colon only. And I'm going to write that down because it's important. Colon only. Ulcerative colitis often presents with left lower quadrant abdominal pain. Why? Because that's where the sigmoid is and sort of the rectum kind of goes through there. Um, so remember with like diverticulitis, it often gives you left lower quadrant pain because it involves those sort of distal parts of the large bowel. So if they can point to an area, it will be the left lower quadrant. And that's in contrast to Crohn's. The labs will be P anca positive. And that is different from Crohn's. Remember Crohn's is ASCA positive. And ASCA stands for anti-saccharomyces cerevisiae antibody, but ulcerative colitis is P. anca positive. Now remember the diseases that are P. anca positive, like Churg Strauss and stuff like that? Uh, so it's not specific for ulcerative colitis, but just look at the clinical picture. I mean, if you're dealing with a patient with asthma and uh, you know, sort of uh, uh, things like that, uh, then obviously it's more like Churg Strauss, but if it's, you know, diarrhea and stuff, then it's UC. So it, sh it shouldn't confuse you. But, you know, if you're just told a patient's Pianca positive, then you don't really know. Major complications for UC include toxic megacolon and colonic adenocarcinoma. Whereas with Crohn's, it's going to be strictures and fistula. Okay, so now we kind of have uh, an idea of the difference between the two.
So this is the pathologic specimen for ulcerative colitis. Notice that we have inflammatory cells primarily limited to the mucosa and a little bit in the submucosa, but it will not go to the adventitia. This is what they love to talk about on exams. So notice inside these crypts, you see abundant inflammatory cells. This is what's known as a crypt abscess. And this is like the, uh, this is kind of like the, this is the pathognomonic finding for ulcerative colitis. Kind of like how you had the, uh, the, sub, the uh, non-casein granulomas for Crohn's. You see crypt abscesses for UC. This is a gross specimen for UC. Notice that there are no skip lesions. So you start here, I guess they're trying to show that this is distal colon here. So ascending colon or sorry, descending colon, and then it works its way up very confluently. There's no areas of healthy bowel uh, within the areas of diseased bowel. Uh, whereas with Crohn's, you may see diseased, healthy, diseased, healthy, diseased, healthy. So you have continuous involvement with UC. On colonoscope, uh, there are a couple things you'll often find. Friable mucosa, you may see ulcerations, and you may see these here, pseudopolyps. Now, do you know whether they're polyps or pseudopolyps by looking at it? No, not really, uh, but these pseudopolyps come with chronic inflammation. Now, this is also very characteristic of UC, and it's called the lead pipe sign. Now, the lead pipe sign will be limited to areas of involvement with UC. So you will see areas uh, starting, I mean, if it's in the descending colon, then you're probably going to see it in the sigmoid and in the rectum. Uh, so here you have descending colon, and it looks like here is your sigmoid and then your rectum. And notice what you have. You have a total loss of haustra. Okay, now what are haustra? Well, it's that stuff, that feature that tells you you're looking at large bowel. So it's these sort of circumferential, I would call them invaginations because that's what they look like, uh, but these sort of lines that you see, and that just tells you you've got large bowel. You have a loss of those in areas that are particularly affected by UC, and that's called the lead pipe sign, and that's characteristic on imaging of UC. Now, a complication that can arise from UC is something called toxic megacolon, and toxic, toxic megacolon looks just like dilated colon, megacolon. And so what it looks like you've got here is uh, dilatation of the transverse colon. Um, now, does this mean obstruction? No, but it looks like it. And this is a problem because the colon gets large and it is at risk for perforation. If you have perforation, you're going to have this finding of subdiaphragmatic air. What you see here is the silhouette of the diaphragm. Uh, so you can see it up here too. And you see the silhouette of the liver. And in between that, you have air. And that is characteristic of some sort of perforation in the peritoneum. You can also see this with Borhoff syndrome, and you can see it with a ruptured peptic ulcer. But you just need your history, and you'll kind of know uh, the what you're dealing with. You know, uh, sudden severe retching would be Borhoff syndrome. History of peptic ulcer disease would be peptic ulcers. History of diarrhea, usually diagnosed uh, ulcerative colitis that's been going on for a long time, is likely to, uh, toxic megacolon. And you can get your plain films and it should give you an idea. The extraintestinal manifestations of IBD include erythema nodosum, which is seen here. They're these painful red nodules uh, that tend to show up on the pretibial area, but they can show up on other extensor surfaces. This is inflammation of the subcutaneous adipose tissue. It is not specific to Crohn's. You may have been told that. It can show up with ulcerative colitis. So erythema nodosum, painful nodules. Pyoderma gangrenosum is an ulceration of the skin. It looks infectious, but it absolutely is not infectious. That said, if it shows up to you, you may want to culture it because any kind of ulcer disruption of the skin can become secondarily infected, and if it is, you'll need to address that. It is associated with other autoimmune dis disorders, so it is not pathognomonic for IBD.
Primary sclerosing cholangitis is highly associated with inflammatory bowel disease, but it can be idiopathic. This causes an obstructive jaundice due to uh, sort of um, obstruction of the, uh, of the uh, bile ducts. And it's generally the small bile ducts. And so if you are taking uh, step one, you'll want to know that it's an onion skin like uh, appearance, obliteration of the of the small bile ducts. Now, this is why we get liver function tests for patients with inflammatory bowel disease, because we're looking for this, because if they have this, then it uh, is something that we need to keep an eye on. Ocular involvement is common with inflammatory bowel disease, uveitis, scleritis, iritis. And then in Crohn's only, you can get these three things. First of all, gallstones. Why would you get gallstones with Crohn's disease? The reason is because, remember, the terminal ileum is commonly affected, and if the terminal ileum is affected, it's going to affect the ability to absorb things. And one of the things that is absorbed in the terminal ileum is bile salts. Now remember, just in general, good idea to know about gallstones is that it is due to a supersaturation of one of two things cholesterol, which causes cholesterol stones, or bilirubin, which causes uh, uh, bilirubin stones. So uh, if you're not absorbing enough bile salts, you'll have more cholesterol relative to bilirubin than you should have. And that's going to favor the precipitation of cholesterol stones. Now you get bilirubin stones with like hemolytic anemias because you have all that excess bilirubin relative to cholesterol. So that's why you get bilirubin stones. Uh, but this will cause cholesterol stones because you have too little uh, bilirubin in the bile. Uh, you can get cholesterol stones from having too much cholesterol in the bile, but this happens to be because you have too little. So either or can cause cholesterol stones. Kidney stones, why? Because when you have inflammation, you absorb more oxalate. And having too much oxalate will favor the development of calcium oxalate stones. And then you can get aphthous ulcers because remember, the entire GI mucosa can be affected by Crohn's, uh, including the oral mucosa. So they get these like canker sores. This is erythema nodosum. Notice these painful red nodules. Pyoderma gangrenosum looks infectious, but it's not. Notice here that you have the surrounding erythema uh, and then your ulcer right here. And then this is the ocular manifestations. So how do we distinguish these? Let's kind of just review because we've talked about all this. First of all, on your CBC, you'll likely see an anemia. Um, if you get the MCV, it may be high or it may be normal. Uh, normal uh, MCV uh, likely is going to be anemia of chronic disease, which is common with long-term inflammation. Uh, if it's high, it suggests uh, macrocytic anemia, and that points to Crohn's. Leukocytosis and thrombocytosis are signs of chronic inflammation. Remember that platelets are an acute phase reactant, so that high platelets are often seen in chronic inflammation. Serum iron will usually be normal in Crohn's. You don't have quite as much bleeding. You can usually replace your red blood cells as you, as you go, but ulcerative colitis has more bleeding, and so often you'll have an iron deficiency. Liver function tests are usually normal, but an elevation suggests the development of PSC. B12 and folate is usually normal in Crohn's, but it can be low, but it'll always be normal in ulcerative colitis. Stool studies are going to show you an absence of infectious elements. Fecal blood is usually positive. Serology, remember ASCA is positive in Crohn's, Pianca is positive, and ulcerative colitis. Now, it's not always positive in these diseases, but uh, these are very specific. So ASCA is never going to be seen in UC. Pianca is never going to be seen in Crohn's. On imaging, remember the skip lesions in Crohn's, wall thickening and fistula, you see that string sign, and the lead pipe colon in UC. Colonoscopy will show you non-continuous involvement in Crohn's, the ileum is also uh, generally involved, and the cobblestoning. Whereas in UC, you see a continuous upward infection and very friable red angry mucosa. On biopsy, you gotta remember, especially if you're taking step one, non-caseating granulomas and Crohn's, whereas in UC, you see those plugged up crypt abscesses.
The differential for IBD, it's really a differential for painful diarrhea. So for uh, diarrhea, painful diarrhea, one big one is IBS. Remember, IBS can be constipation or diarrhea. Diarrhea is a little bit more common in my experience. Uh, with IBS, it is non-inflammatory. So no lab evidence of inflammation. CBC will be normal. ESR, you know, you get your SED rate and uh, CRP and stuff like that will be totally normal. Uh, and a big feature of IBS is that the pain is relieved by defecation. Whereas with Crohn's and UC, the pain is more constant because there's always that inflammation even after they defecate. Infectious colitis is going to be more acute, comes on suddenly. Often they have a history of travel or maybe some sick contacts. The infectious agent is often uh, found on stool studies. Pseudomembranous colitis, dead giveaway there is recent antibiotic use. Uh, the C. diff toxin on the stool studies will often come back positive. If you did do a colonoscopy, you'd find those gray pseudomembranes, which are uh, you can peel away with your colonoscope. That's typical for pseudomembranous colitis. Ischemic colitis, uh, there's often a history of atherosclerosis. Maybe the patient's got angina and they've uh, you know, had heart attacks or strokes in the past. Uh, maybe they're on medications, nitrates and stuff. Uh, the abdominal pain, this is super important. The abdominal pain is associated with eating. This is angina of the bowel. So, you know, a patient with angina of the heart will get chest pain when they exercise. A patient with ischemic colitis will get abdominal pain when they eat. And that's because when you eat, there's an increased oxygen demand in the gut and you can't get as, as much blood there because you have atherosclerosis and so you're going to get pain. Uh, diarrhea, plus or minus with, with ischemic colitis, uh, but uh, it is on the differential. If you did a colonoscopy, you'll often see friability at the splenic flexure. Why? Well, because, let's say this is the colon here, and you have your ascending colon and your transverse colon. This is all supplied by superior mesenteric artery. And then you get to the splenic flexure, and you start to be supplied by inferior mesenteric artery. This area where you transition is at the splenic flexure, and it's called a watershed zone. And it's an area that is very highly susceptible to ischemia. So the splenic flexure is the area that tends to be affected with ischemic colitis. The treatment. So for treatment, we use a stepwise approach, and that's because with each medication that we move to, there are slightly worse side effects. And so we try to keep these patients on the minimal treatment possible. So for mild cases, we often go to tapered budesonide, or you can use uh, mesalamine, 5-ASA, pentaza, all the same thing. Uh, so that is our treatment for mild cases. Now, if that does not work, then you move to corticosteroids, um, and then you can uh, use these anti-metabolites uh, or not use them. Uh, but if you do move to anti-metabolites, uh, then you need to get a TPMT phenotype. And that is important because it has to do with the metabolism of these drugs. If uh, they have an abnormal TPMT, then you really can't use these drugs. Uh, so important to get that. It may show up on your step. Uh, so good to know. Uh, refractory cases, then you will use your steroids. You may use cyclosporine or more commonly nowadays, they go to anti-TNF therapy. And that is infliximab, also known as Remicade. And this is anti-TNF. Now remember, TNF is responsible for the maintenance of granulomas. Lots of people have been exposed to tuberculosis and they don't know it. Um, and so if they have been exposed, they'll often have granulomas and they don't know it. And if you give them TNF therapy or anti-TNF therapy, you will compromise those granulomas. And remember, it's the granulomas that are keeping the tuberculosis in check. So you can wind up reactivating a latent tuberculosis, and that is no bueno. So you've got to get a PPD before starting anti-TNF therapy. These patients will get colonoscopy at 8 to 10 years post-diagnosis. So if they are diagnosed at 32, like our patient in the vignette or however old he was, uh, then he's going to get a colonoscopy at 40 to 42 years. Uh, then after that, 
you will get a colonoscopy biannually. Now, specific to UC, colectomy is curative, so that would probably be your next step. It sucks. It really reduces your quality of life. You've got to have a bag. You've got to change it. It's kind of gross. So that is something that's sort of last resort. Topical agents are available for rectal involvement. That's kind of nice because it's not a systemic uh, steroid. For Crohn's, you need to watch out for strictures and fistula. If they have one of these, you need to refer them to surgery. If they have a fistula, then you need to give them antibiotics. The antibiotics of choice are ciprofloxacin and metronidazole, both of them. The adverse effects for steroids, as I'm sure you're aware, are weight gain, uh, electrolyte derangement, so hypernatremia, hypokalemia, and the possibility of infection. 6-MP and azathioprine can cause a re uh, drug-induced pancreatitis as well as myelotoxicity and infliximab, as we already talked about, reactivation of latent TB. Now, I just want to point out that there's another drug that's been approved for ulcerative colitis that is not responsive to TNF therapy, and it's called tofacitinib. Okay, so that is a drug that is, uh, is uh, in our arsenal. It's also called... Zeljans. I think I'm I think I'm spelling that right. <laughs> okay. So the management of com complications. Um, I mean, you should be sort of aware of all these uh, possibilities. So colon cancer uh, is is uh, increased risk after the disease has been present for ten years. So that's why we do surveillance colonoscopy. Toxic megacolon, we talked about strictures, we talked about fistula and abscesses, we talked about the antibiotics that you need to use for that, and the surgical referral. For management of flares, so if they have a sudden worsening of their symptoms, usually they'll show up to the ED. You'll give them IV fluids because they've likely had some diarrhea, maybe some blood loss. You'll get routine labs, CBC, liver function tests, all that stuff. C. diff toxin assay, plus or minus, depends on if they've been on antibiotics. Pregnancy test, always in women of childbearing age, because most of these patients have lower abdominal pain, you always need to exclude the possibility of an ectopic pregnancy. Be sure to be vigilant for acute complications, such as obstruction, perforation, toxic megacolon, and investigate accordingly, typically with plain film x-rays. You'll admit these patients, start IV corticosteroids, and uh, keep them on diet as tolerated. Often, though, they'll want them to be NPO because there's a possibility they may need a colonoscopy. You'll assess their progress if the symptoms are remitting. You'll switch the IV corticosteroids to PEO, taper it. If the symptoms are persisting, then you can consider surgical options. Often you'll be referring these patients to a gastroenterologist anyway, but you'll probably want to get their input. And that's all I've got for you. So hopefully um, this wasn't too painful. Um, I'll see you next time.